Romans 6. Interesting. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And that includes everybody in this room. We were past tense baptized into his death. And if we didn't recognize we were baptized into his death, then we need to go back to when we were baptized and remember that, hey, we were baptized into his death. D-E-A-T-H. You were dead to sin. We were, past tense, buried, therefore with him in by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised, past tense, from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Second Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Yep. Lord, show me that. The oldest past, behold, a new creation is what it reads in the Greek. A new thing. But we have to put off the dead self and when it comes up to try to get us again we have to sever the tie and that's where the died self daily in Luke 9 23 comes in yeah if you read the downward spiral in Romans 1 the brain rot let me go over there the brain rot is what Paul is bringing the hammer to in Romans 6 It says here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, but God, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. Meaning we are without excuse. For although they knew God... They had a personal, intimate relationship with him. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, which leads the way to futility, depression, and a whole host of other nonsensical, foolish behaviors. Yep. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds and animals and creeping things. So animals worshiping and worshiping humans. How many men know and the women say to their significant other, you are my everything, you are my world? Many. No, no he doesn't. Do. Nope. Nope, never. Are you pointing at me? He has never said that. <laughs> are you pointing at me? Uh, yes. I'm not that kind of a... Nor am I. Um, no, I, I mean, like, I mean, like, to grandma, you'd say, oh, like, you're my everything, kind of like, you're my everything. Nope. For, like, a marriage or something. Nope. Yeah, but it, he never used those types of words. Not in our marriage vows. Yeah, that's reserved for the Lord. I don't mean you, yeah. those exact words. But he does. He's, like, he's, he's talking oh. very specifically about the people that focus their whole life on their husband, their wife, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, whatever, and it's like, you're my, people use language like this, you're my everything, my old life depends on you, I'm nothing without you, and, and that's not the place that anyone should have. Only person that should have that place is Jesus. When we turn here and focus on the relationship and we forget up here, then it all becomes there, and they become your focus, and then they become your God. So, moving from there. They exchanged the image of the immortal God, the glory of the immortal God, for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things, and they worshipped those things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relationships... For those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts of men, women committing shameless acts with women, receiving themselves a due penalty for their error. And so they, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a deep-based mind 
and probably also a depressed mind, and probably also to futility to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they, do, they know God's righteous decree, and those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but get approval to those who practice them, and so reap iniquity. So, because the iniquity is when, if you, so you if you have your own pool of whatever sin you do, when you encourage, or invite, or, or, or have conversation with others, in, in joining you, that gets to iniquity. So rebellion is to be specifically against, somebody says, here's a boundary line, you specifically cross it, you know, the, the word says there's a boundary line, God says, you know, the, we said there's a boundary line, you know, your employer says there's a boundary line, the police officer says there's a boundary line, crossing that boundary line, that's a rebellion. Um, iniquity is when we invite others to do the same. Hey, come with me, let's do this, well, we're, that's against the rules, well, let's do it anyway, that's iniquity. Um, and at that point, he's going to have a choice to either, at some point, give you up to your own mindset, your own futility, which is going to lead to depression, which is going to lead to all a host of other mental disorders. It's true. He's also going to give you up to your sins, so it's like, you want it? Go have it. I mean, but before Go he have puts it. you there... It. He's going to convict you. Yes. He's going to give you opportunity to make a change. He's going to pick people to speak truth into your life. But the truth is, we all have a free will. And if we re repeatedly use our free will to go against the word, or against what he's put in your heart, or against that niggle inside that says, don't do it, or draw close to me, or, hey, it's the morning, let's spend some time with me, the more you reject each of his little invitations, the harder your heart gets. And the more deception you allow in, because you give the enemy access to come in. And, and, and then, so, so each, really, the truth is, and I, I don't hear this from the pulpit very often, but it's very, very true. Every decision you make matters. Every decision matters. Even stupid little decisions. Are you giving in? To, are, you, are, you, are you following after what the Lord has for you? Are you making intentional progress in your walk with Him? Are you doing the things that you're supposed to do? And that includes school and, and, and whatever. And we do have a lot of free choice. You know, do I want an apple or an orange? Okay, well, that's cool. Um, but there are, there are definitely choices that we make that lead us closer to him or away from mm -hmm. him. Um, and, and, and that accumulation, at some point the Lord says, okay, you really want this? You, you go for it. <coughs> but... You're going to reap the consequences of it. I was going to go with, continue with the, what we were doing in Matthew, but then the Lord said, no, you're reading Romans 6, 1 through 6. And I said, because I knew I was buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life, you know, but it's just like, oh, this other stuff fells out. Then you're going to go over here and chain reference over here. So you can deal with this other stuff that's over here. Because we have a whole lot of non-reality on this land, because we're on exhorter land, and our responsibility is to deal with the non-reality and bring some hard lines. Yeah. Do they know where we are? Huh? Do they know where we are? I can't hear you. Do they know where we are? Who? The people that are that would listen to this video. I like he says, we're on exhorter land, but never mind. Yeah, yes, I, I will. Okay, oh, hold on. You're right. Myrtle Beach is where we are, South Carolina. Exhorter land, the gift, the treasure in the land is new revelation about the nature of God. Which means the principle here, the principle of reality, is that we know reality about the nature of God, specifically the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the great exhorter. And it says here, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So, if we die to sin... And if we say, body of death, I'm done with you, then he'll raise us up to hope and resurrection and fulfillment and a fulfilling life beyond everything we can even ask, think, or imagine. 
We know that our old self, verse 6, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So good. He wants us free. Sometimes, often, he wants us free more than we want ourselves free. We say we want ourselves free, but we're not willing to do what it takes to get there. You know, we say, oh, I'm depressed. Oh, I have to go and, and hurt myself, or I have to go engage in this other nonsense and focus on my, on my problem and focus on how depressed my depression is. Dude, you're emo. Get a, get a haircut and a job. Go do some stuff with your life. Go look up for your redemption draws nigh. Don't look in, look up. If you die to sin, you will live and be raised to walk in the newness of life if you look for the hope. Mm -hmm. But you have to look for the hope, and he's holding it out. Proverbs, there's a song by, there's a couple of songs by Sixpence None the Richer that talk about wisdom in the streets crying out. Nobody hunts for what the treasures that she has. Wisdom. She being wisdom. I'm, she has. I'm reading that in Proverbs. She has a whole lot of stuff to offer you. Counsel. I am here to buy gold refined in the fire, naked and poor, wretched and blind. I come clothe me in white so that I won't be ashamed. Revelation. He's counseling us to buy gold that has been tried in the fire. And that's the kind of gold you want. Because if you let the impurities in, then uh, stay in, and they lie dormant, then when the mistreatment or the offense comes, those come up to the surface, and those reveal your character, and oh, you're offended, and then you're entrapped. But like we studied a couple days ago with the Bay of Satan, as those as as those trials come, because they will, what comes up to the surface instead of feeling shame about it, go so, okay, well it's been revealed now. I'm really, I'm, I'm not happy it's there, but I'm going to confess the sin. I'm going to ask the Lord to clean it up, and I'm going to make a change. It was there. Cool. Well, now we know it's there. So you know what that breaks? That breaks part of the mesmerizing spirit, and that breaks the spirit of deception. Because if you can suddenly realize that there's an issue, and then face it and deal with it, you've broken the deception around that issue. Yep. Which is a good thing. It doesn't feel good in the moment. But the truth is, it's a really good thing. I had an issue that I had to deal with, and I had to confess to my wife and talk to, some, talk to her about some stuff, and we prayed and dealt with stuff, stuff that's tied to the defilement on this land, and we got things squared away. But if I let it lie dormant, it grows into a stronghold, walls of a city, contentions like bars of iron, Proverbs 19.18, if I remember correctly, or 18.19, one of the two. Um... I didn't want to go here, and the Lord's dropped this down. I was just like, really? You really want to deal with this? Yes. Okay. Fine. So, Romans 6. He wants you to die to sin. There's a reason. It's because it's distracting you from your destiny. 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 It is distracting you from your destiny. So. It was just funny how you did that. I know. It's distracting you. So. Our job, gang, it's distracting you from your destiny. Your birthright. You have a birthright. And if you get offended and live in your depression and live in your nonsense and live in your... And you're just whatever you want to do rather than what the Lord made you to do, then you'll end up living a life of futility. And we do not want that for you. And we bless you with fulfillment. We bless you with a hard dose of reality. We bless you with the medicine that the Lord has for you, the wine and the salve for your wounds. Because he binds up the brokenhearted. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 is a really good passage to go and read. Matter of fact, I'm going to go there. This will be where we close off. Isaiah 48, 55, also good. Come, ho, he who is thirsty. Father, tell me to give you orange juice.
Florida boy loves orange juice a whole lot. I know. <laughs> you look like a little kid in a candy store. <laughs> I'm holding my mother and my grandmother's hand. I went to welcome station. Awesome. Yeah, you look like a little kid at a candy store. You know what that looks like. Mm. Because I've done that? Holy moly. And chapter 61. Isaiah. Yep. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news for the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Part of the reason that we get stuck in the depression is because we have broken hearts. And the Lord comes not just... He doesn't just deliver you over to sin. If you're wounded and hurting, He comes to bind up your broken heart so that you're capable of walking less with that body of death. You gotta let Him. To proclaim... He wants to love on you. You gotta let him. Yes, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, <clears throat> the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, the spirit of despair, spirit of depression there are so many times we encounter depression and we think oh it's my mind something's wrong with me no it's a spirit in some cases yes it's true the question is do you have the skill to discern which it is he can fix the chemical imbalances he can fix the spirit bad company corrupts good character who are you keeping company with? Your closest hangs, your best friends, your income, your lifestyle will mirror theirs. Do you want their lifestyle? Find some new hangs if you don't want the lifestyle of your current hangs, your current friends, your current buds. We all have levels. So the people that are closest to you are going to have a very heavy influence. So if we're doing healing or ministry or whatever with somebody you don't want that to be somebody in your inner circle you want people in your inner circle that are going to point you to the lord encourage you to be the best version of yourself point stuff out when you're doing being goofy doing the wrong thing encourage you to jump in the lord's furnace so he can purify you yep encourage and walk with you even sometimes through the affliction and the trials and the pains and 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 to have your back and that's the kind of friend you want to be as well you want to be pointing them to Jesus. You want to be in the Word, giving them Scripture. You want to be helping them to go into their birthright and standing with them when they're in the fire of affliction or when their heart is broken or when they've been betrayed. Not letting them get a root of offense and bitterness, but to help them forgive. That's the friend you want to be, and those are the friends you want around you in your tight inner circle. Okay. Then we've got the, a bigger circle of, you know, more casual friends that we have. A, we can have a little more influence on healing. A little more influence. We don't want to let them influence us as much. We want to be more of an influencer. Okay? Cool to hang out with. Cool to have fun with. Cool to play ball with or, or draw with or whatever. But the but not not somebody you share your most intimate secrets with. Are they? Yeah, these are not the kind of people when you say, these are the kind of people that are not going to challenge you. These are the kind of people that are just going to meh, accept you. Yeah, exactly. And then the, uh, the more outer circular acquaintances or people you know in school or somebody you bump into or, you know, whatever. You might have a group of people go to a movie or, you know, a larger group. And, that, and, and, and that's, that's your prime group for people, for the Lord to go, hey, minister to that person or speak life to that person or love on that person. But realize that the brokenness inside that person or the pain inside that person is going to come out. You can't let that pain and brokenness compute onto you. You, you let the godliness inside of you and the, tr the truth and the life and the hope inside of you minister to them. And you're going to have a serious effect in this there. But that's not somebody you share your deepest heart with because the, the, the brokenness and the pain and the poison inside of them is going to influence you. And it matters. And you need to be careful. You've got to protect your heart and you've got to let people in. You've got to have people close to you that are, that are pointing you to the right direction. Because they will influence you for better or for worse. And, and, and you will pay the consequences for that 
for better or for worse. That they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities of the devastation of many generations. I need to have people around me when I'm going through a hard time, or I'm angry, or I'm hurting, and I call them, and I've got lots of reasons, and I can justify an action that I know in my heart is not the right action, they're going to say, <clears throat> You do have those reasons, and you do have that justification, and I understand. But I also know that you're a woman of God, and you have character, and you're listening to God, and 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 and, and to make this choice. And they're going to stand with me, even when the circumstances look dark, and say, I'm championing with you to make the right choice, to do the right thing. And I need people like that, because if, if I'm a little swayed off track, they're going to help me get back on track. And I know who I can call when I'm feeling a little off track that are going to say, ah, oh, no, this is the way you want to go. And that's a critical component of your life. So you need to pray regularly for God to put one, two, three people in your life like that. Okay? They can accept you for where you're at now, but yep. they can also challenge you. To go better. Because if you got friends that only accept you and don't challenge you. That's not an inner circle of friends. And, and truthfully, because, you know, you guys are young and the maturity level of the people around you is not there, that's part of the role we play. So when we do the, hey, this, I'm going to challenge you to go on your birthright, I'm going to challenge you to walk further, I'm going to challenge you to be in the Word every day, um, this isn't us being, you know, controlling jerks. This is us saying, we love you. And part of our job is the iron sharpens iron. If you think about iron sharpens iron, that's a painful, hard process. You know, how do you make a sword, love? Iron, water, fire, water, Exactly. Iron, water, you heat it up, pound, 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 stuff it into the ice water, okay? Heat it back up again, pound, 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 stick it in the ice water, it's called tempering. And that is a painful, painful process. That's part of our job in your lives we're trying to grow you into men and women of Christ. Oh, they don't accept me. The issue is not acceptance. The issue is, do we have the acceptance and are we capable of challenging you? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. You're playing Minecraft. And you're stuck with zombies and creepers and surrounded. Do you want to be far from home or do you want to be close to home? Close. Do you want to have a bed in your house? Yes. yes. So, so be careful how much you judge us when we're when we're correcting you and talking to you because it's, it's because we love you. We are home. We are safe place. We are bed. There are no creepers in our home. We do not permit them. Right. And we're not perfect. And we screw up. But we love you. And the Lord does correct us. And he does bring us back on track. And, and he does cause us to fight those things that are outside. We right. have the swords in our hand. We do battle for you guys. You guys know nothing about a lot of it generational battles, battles on our land, battles all over the place. Um, and it's, it's our honor to do it. And you guys need to learn to do it. Because one day you're going to have to do it for your family and your friends and the people close to you. But we're a training ground for you. This is, this is, this is your version of boot camp growing up with us. And going through the teenage years with all the hormones and all the changes that go on, there's even more boot camp because you're, you're going to be like, I'm growing into, and we're going to help redirect you. Yeah, and when you're get, you know, given to distractions, we're going to say, that's the distraction. You're going to waste your life doing that. And then we give you the option. You choose to go off and do whatever it is. It's like, okay. Yeah. So. But, but really our heart is to, to help you each walk the fullness of what God has for you. Most believers, not some not a few. Most believers do not fulfill their birthright. There's so many birthrights that go unfulfilled because they don't fill, fill the birthright. And you have an opportunity to fulfill yours. God has a problem. He has people that are wanting to live lives that are unfulfilling. And he has all these birthrights stuck in his warehouse that he's trying to hand out. That's right. And even if even if you fulfill yours, you can. if you want to really rise to the challenge, you can ask God to give you more. Because you can have more than one birthright. And we can take somebody else's and fulfill it and 
further the kingdom. Awesome. Awesome. And it's possible that one or more of your birthrights are already not possible. Um, because of generational nonsense. And if you get that feeling, you go to the Lord and go, okay, if I can't fulfill my birthright, give me a new one. And, and that help me to walk it out. He yeah. will. It matters. But he has to know you're interested and you're willing to do it. Because a birthright is a problem to solve, which means there's pain involved. There's there's there's, there's dis discipline involved. There's decisions involved. There's relationships involved. There's relationships involved. And, and, and it's awesome. Um... And, uh, and and worth pursuing. Yeah, unfortunately, as much as we'd like to, we can't barf out rainbows and fart out unicorns every day. Sometimes we have to hand you vegetables and say, you need to chew, it's time. Sometimes we hand you nuts because your heart likes nuts. It's made for nuts, and we have to say, sure. chew. Sure. Do you have a question, or are you just waving your hand around? Just waving my hand around. Okay. So, be at peace. Know we love you. Know that he has made you to be dead to sin and alive to him. And he has a great plan for you. But you have to choose it. Be Amen. at peace, y'all. Bye-bye.